I talked to you in the beginning about the influence of the Watteau paintings, the uh, 17th century Watteau paintings on the automaton makers, and here we have another wonderful example. A popular theme with the automaton makers was the shepherdess um, out in the fields, and so I, I don't know if there were any shepherdesses ever in the field that were wearing beautiful silk costumes like this one, but in our fantasy, in the pieces that were going to go into the salon, this is an example of what you want. I want to turn her around so you can see her exquisite silk costuming all the way around, very much in the Watteau manner of the 17th century style. What is very notable about this particular one, again, um, Gail Cook continues her pursuit of seeking the most beautiful bisque portrait faces, and this one has, again, the flat cut neck, which was needed to accommodate the automaton movements, but also has then the bisque shoulder plate as well with the molded bosom, which accentuates her being an adult lady, um, being out in the field as a shepherdess. And let's turn her on and watch her movements, her beautiful movements, and listen to wonderful music. Did you see me jump when that lamb bleated? Because <laughs> when that happens, it's wonderful. The woman turns her head side to side, but not just turning. It's in a convoluted, realistic movement of the head. She's lifting her flowers that she holds in her left hand as though to call the other lambs to come. And meanwhile, she's carrying her favorite pet lamb in this wonderfully decorated wicker basket and occasionally the lid lifts as though he's peeking his head out and wants to greet his fellow lambs and then occasionally turns his head, bleats, and the lid goes back down because she tells him go back to sleep. A wonderful imaginative piece and just beautifully, beautifully preserved. One of my favorites from the Gail Cook collection of automatons is the one I have simply determined the lady at the races. I, I even called Gail and conferred with her. I said, Gail, I've never been able to find this piece. I've never seen it anywhere. What, are, what is our imagination that she's doing? Or what, did you ever find any catalogs? And Gail said, no, I just always imagined she was at the races. And that, to me, just struck a chord because that was such a fashionable thing to do. Ladies would dress up and they would go to the races and they would have their, their uh, binoculars if they were watching the horses. And this piece has so, it just has so much going for it. I love it. Wonderful music. When her veil lifts, which it is going to do, you have to look at her face. It is stunning. It is so beautiful. Wonderful costume and these very graceful movements. And before, when I said, you remember how these pieces would be so fine if they were set in an arrangement with your other more classic bisque dolls that are not automatons? This one certainly could because she is exactly of the right size. So let's watch and listen to her movements. One of the very finest pieces in Gail Cook's collection, which he acquired originally from the famous Christian Bailly private collection, is a, a piece known as the Lady Magician or Magician by Jean Roulet also, as she was described in their catalog at the time. Um, she was number 201 in the catalog, and she was considered one of the five most luxurious pieces they made both in terms of the quality of the costuming, the presentation of the bisque portrait head, and the entire luxurious accoutrements of the velvet covered table, and the wonderful music and the wonderful accessories. There is so much going on here, so you have to really be watching it. Now, once again, notice we have the flat bisque portrait head, and we have the bisque shoulder plate with the molded bosom to really enhance her uh, magician status. And there, she's going to tap the table, she's going to tap the pieces, 
and one by one the different pieces, although in no particular order, are going to open and the little magic performers underneath will do their tricks. So let's watch and enjoy. Just reviewing a few more details. If you notice the wonderful embroidered flowers on the table cover, the metallic, um, the gilt metallic fringe, which matches the gilt metallic soutache on her wonderful embroidery. She even has the carved paper mache horns, I guess some type of a symbol of the magician. And once again, stunning paperweight eyes and a beautiful bisque head. Just a fabulous piece in every way. The, the fun of collecting automaton is that they can range from very, very simple pieces, a little, um, very, basically taking a Jumeau small child and putting it into simple actions of fanning herself and reading a book, to the very luxurious pieces I was just showing you, to very supersized paper mache headed um, characters doing things. Some of my favorites is this particular genre. Um, they are automaton, but they're more like a, a vignette that you would put in your parlor, in your salon, and you, again, try to, my way of thinking when I see this, I see how this would be the most incredible centerpiece for a group of French fashion dolls. And here we have this very, very idyllic setting of this elegant lady in her garden arbor, filled with beautiful silk covered flowers. She's sitting there and she's doing needlework in her hand in front of her little table which is covered with little sewing accessories, little necessaires, even a little porcelain teacup and saucer. So a very, very charming scene. And watch in this piece, the music, um, need, the music mechanism would need to be replaced, but I wanted you to see it because to me, you don't even have to play this. You just can have this as a center vignette. If you wanted to replace it, it's a simple music box mechanism. It could be done. But look at how she's turning her head. She's likely she's watching the birds or listening to um, the beautiful garden setting, seeing the flowers, and continues to work on her wonderful needlework. Very, very wonderful piece. One of my favorites in the whole collection. The Gail Cook collection has about four of these wonderful vignette pieces, and I just think they are so spectacular. In this wonderful example, with its original um, domed room setting, uh, which was actually shown in some of the earlier catalogs, has wonderful features such as mirrors on three sides. So wherever you're standing looking at this, you're seeing the woman's face or her beautiful uh, coiffure. She's sitting at her piano and she is elegantly playing the piano, just like the lady Watteau was playing the piano earlier on. And beautiful music is playing. On these pieces, the mechanism and the music were wound separately. That's why she's continuing to play the piano now, even though you have heard the music stop. And were I now to pull the music string out again, the music would continue in time to her hands. Many of these pieces were designed for the British market, and they appeared in some of the early um, London catalogs, such as that of Silber and Fleming in the early 1880s.
curiously, while Falabois was famous for his wonderful vignette settings that I've just shown you, we have another piece by him, which to me is such an extraordinary and very, very rare piece. In the beginning of the 1890s, Emile Jumeau was commissioned by some of the doll maker, by some of the automaton makers, to create very distinctive character faces, which would enhance the action that they were showing in their automaton. I'm going to show you a few more later on. One of the very, very rare models is this boy, the whistling boy. Um, and he is distinctly modeled because if you, I'm going to turn so the camera can pick up the wonderful detail of the puckering of his lips. This is, a very, this is not a casual um, expression achieved simply by painting, but it's an actually unique sculpture with a very, very uh, defined facial expression of a young boy whistling. I'm going to turn it the other way. And as a doll, which we have seen one or two models only as a doll, it was a very, very rare model made as a doll. And this is the only example I know of the piece made with a flat cut neck and designed as the whistling piece, a very, very luxurious model. And I now want to show you something, and I want you to listen to the music, and you will recognize a tune that all of us know, which is Daisy Daisy, Give Me Your Answer True, and it's A Bicycle Built for Two. Do you know what year A Bicycle Built for Two was written? 1893, the very time that this doll was being released. And it is such the most perfectly chosen song to express this kind of insouciant, saucy, um, devil may care look that this young boy has. So we have a very, very rare song produced and written by the musician in the very same year that this automaton was made. I think it's an extraordinary um, combination of popular culture on this very rare piece. So let's watch him go. Remember, not just whistling, but whistling an actual tune. I sometimes wonder what caused the, what, who commissioned these pieces? Did the theater commission them? Did, was it commissioned for like a World's Fair? Was it commissioned by an automaton maker? We'll never know any of these background stories. Well, we might, we find new discoveries all the time, but it does, it makes me curious and I love the research of going in and finding out more and more about the pieces and I hope whoever is lucky enough to acquire this will continue that research. Those people who collect these rare character face dolls, um, this is an extraordinary example to add to your collection. The character faces made by Jumeau, commissioned from Jumeau by the automaton makers, continued to be made in the early 1890s with very, very expressive features. And once again, later were taken by Jumeau we changed the structure of the neck socket so no, lo no longer was the flat cut neck socket needed for the automatons, but made it the standard d doll neck socket and made into doll form, which are very rare and extremely sought after by collectors today. Um, to me, it's always very interesting because we have here two of these wonderful character faces uh, that were commissioned by Jumeau. Um, and you can buy the automatons for about 25% of the price that you would pay for the doll with this character face. So what a fabulous opportunity. You're getting mechanical mu uh, movements of great charm. You're getting beautiful music and you're getting a very, very rare bis character face on these two pieces, both made by Lambert. And let's just enjoy them for a minute. Little girl with her pet bird and she's feeding him cherries. Back of the costume. 
and the bird is moving back and forth in the cage and she is absolutely delighted with her treasure. On the other hand, we have her friend who is not having such a good day. This was the very sought after, rare crying character face made by Jumeau, very, very appealing and particularly rare on the automaton when it has, as this one does, the original tear on the cheek, the crystal tear. And this little girl is playing with her Polichinelle toy, which is obviously not pleasing her. He keeps falling down and she's trying to make him work as a puppet and it's not working. She's trying to lift him and he just keeps falling over and she cries. Dabs her face, her tear, and tries again. She's wearing her completely original costume, which is very beautifully preserved and wonderful original wig. So we've just seen the Polichinelle, and the Polichinelle theme was so popular in Paris in the um, about 1875 to 1900. It's used in so many as separate figures by itself, as puppets and automatons, um, always costumed with a very traditional humps. Uh, Polichinelle was from the Italian um, comedy dell'arte, and he represented a very, very particular character, someone who had these very disfiguring parts of his body, but he managed to always act to people like he was just telling that one person, explaining about him, but he, they could never discuss it with anyone else. So the whole world walked around pretending that Polichinelle was just a happy little child. And it was, it was a kind of a famous story and a famous legend, sort of like the emperor wore no clothes, and everyone's ignoring the fact that the emperor's driving down the street wearing no clothes. A very um, um, interesting take on that. I was trying to do some research earlier to find out more of the background on it, and I just kept coming across this same notion of what Polichinelle was, which I had never realized. I found it exciting, and you might too, but very popular character in France during the end of the 1800s. So here's a very, just a simple little girl with a Jumeau head and a traditional Polichinelle costume. I'm just, let me just turn it around so you can see that before she begins her action. And this is a very, very classic costume that a Polichinelle figure would wear too, although Polichinelle is usually a boy. In this case, she is a girl, Polichinella. And let's let her go. Simple actions, moving of the head, clapping of the cymbals, um, but very beautifully presented piece. On the other hand, we have this wonderful piece. This piece was actually uh, deposed or patented by Leopold Lambert because it was so distinctive and unique for him and had so many wonderful movements. We have this little bisqueted girl who was wearing her original costume. She's seated on the assumedly the living room floor, and she's playing with her various toys, her rattle and her little pet monkey upon which is seated Polichinelle. And let's watch and listen to everything we're doing here. She's blinking her eyes, she's waving her rattle, she's point raving the bells, the donkey goes back and forth, he nods his head up and down, and wonderful music plays. <laughs> 